Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Association Leadership Radio. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Association Leadership Radio, and this is going to be a good one. Today on the show, we have Dan Maddox with the American Payroll Association. Welcome, Dan. Hi, Lee. Hey, so excited to learn what you're up to. Tell us a little bit about American Payroll Association. How are you serving folks? Thank you, Lee. The American Payroll Association was founded in 1982. We're a professional organization that is comprised of individuals that are responsible for payroll management. We also attract professionals from HR and other payroll-related corporate financial responsibilities. The APA represents payroll professionals across the U.S., and increasingly from across the globe that have U.S. payroll responsibilities. Annually, we conduct training programs, conferences, seminars, and an annual convention and expo. Through a myriad of in-person and virtual deliveries, we reach about 75,000 individuals with some type of education experience annually. How has the payroll industry kind of evolved over the years in that I'm sure at at one point it was all kind of corporations doing payroll for their employees and now we're living in a world where there's so many subcontractors, there's so many, you know, kind of software as a service solutions for payroll. How have you seen the industry evolve? Uh, The industry has evolved in many ways, I guess, you know, to a great extent, because we're a professional organization and we serve the individuals in their professional journey. We've seen the industry involved in the fact that, you know, products and services are constantly evolving and changing. So that is something that, that professionals in the industry need to keep up with. Often those products are for payroll and HR. So it, they're working with their partners in HR whenever a company is going through any kind of change, I would say more and more payroll are brought to the table and helping to make that decision. Historically, before that, you know, decades ago, payroll often found out about the changes and it wasn't necessarily something that they were part of, but certainly they were part of the implementation. These days, I would say that they definitely have a seat at the table and helping to make those decisions. And they're, of course, part of the implementation. And that's where I'd say that the industry has grown considerably in the fact that They do have a leadership seat at the table. And more and more, which we always try to expose to our members, is that you have payroll professionals or people that have even risen to being at C-suite level. And often when you will meet, let's say, payroll vice presidents or officers in a corporation, they begin to think that they're the only ones. And some cases, that's why, let's say over the years, they have become less engaged with our association because they really do truly think that they're the only one that exists in the industry. And you bring them to the table and you ask them to share their story. And then they come to realize that there are actually a lot more people in their position in the industry, which shows you that the industry is evolving and it's changing. And, um, their positions have become more strategic, they still are going to have the regulatory and compliance aspects that payroll is responsible for, but they have become more strategic players. And I think that the great thing about that, not only for those people that are in the C-suite positions in payroll, but for the general people in the industry, is that for them, they thought that there was this ceiling and that for them to move further in their career, they had to leave payroll. And now it allows them to redefine um, their career objectives and the fact that they really can truly go further in their profession. Now, um, how do you kind of uh, share the information with your folks? Do you do it through chapters? Do you have national conferences? Do you have online learning? Like, how how do people interact with the, the, the knowledge that you're willing to share? We do have 125 affiliated chapters, but I would say the way we uh, communicate more with our members is certainly through the host of publications that we have. We have eight attorneys on staff that research and write, but we also have what we consider a customer or membership publications. We have several of those. Um, 
predominantly as an organization uh, beyond the work that we do in DC with government agencies, most of what we do is communicated through education. So we have education to take them throughout their entire journey. So through um, what would be, you know, foundations, uh, which of course companies utilize us for to train people as they're coming into the profession, but also throughout, you know, their career all the way up to management. So we, um, we train over 75,000 people a year through the myriad of education that we provide. Um, that historically, of course, there was a lot of in-person learning is what we did. We years ago, prior to the pandemic, we began to move uh, quite a bit of what we did virtually. And uh, I would say that in the, the years of the pandemic, you know, uh, two years plus, we uh, moved so much of what we did um, for the myriad of training programs that we provide, you know, one, two, three, up to five day uh, learning programs. We moved to virtual formats. We even um, moved our annual convention for a couple of years to a virtual format. And when we were now, while we had a virtual um, delivery for over 10 years for our annual convention, it did challenge us to pivot to move everything that we did to a virtual format for those two years, even the delivery of our certification exams. And um, while I'm not saying I'm looking forward to another pandemic, I would tell you that we made the pandemic a really great learning experience. And we had to do a lot of soft and hard pivots. But we figured if we're going to have to move everything that we do to virtual deliveries, which we are very skilled at doing, but also a annual convention and an expo, we're going to be the best. Because I saw so many organizations that were deciding not to do much in 20 and de-escalated what they would normally do in 21 as well. And now today they're still catching up. And we had really no downtime. While we may have had some slight delays because we had to pivot to new deliveries, I would tell you that our virtual convention in 20 was it was very exciting. And then when we knew we had to do it for 21, we could even make it more exciting. And what I loved coming back to an in-person convention in 22 was that I met people that, you know, were members or, you know, customers for years and knew about our convention called Peril Congress, but they had never really considered attending. But they decided to attend it because it was offered virtually. And they said, if they can make it this exciting virtually, I've got to attend in person. So what I thought was um, great about that is that we knew that what we were providing during the pandemic was substantial. But when you are speaking to customers face to face that are telling you that what you delivered during the pandemic was so inviting and exciting that it that it was essentially the marketing tool that made them come to their first in person convention. To me, that was very powerful. Now, did that trickle down to the chapter level as well? Did the f- folks locally, uh, were they able to uh, kind of make the best of a bad situation um, in their local markets? Um, every chapter is different, of course, and they're affiliated chapters. Um, but what we did do is we offered them Zoom licenses and um, having um, their national organization be so apt at, you know, um, at, at provide. We embraced virtual many years ago. So even uh, by the fact that we had more than one office, we were uh, originally located in New York City, moved the headquarters to San Antonio. We've always had multiple offices, Washington, D.C. So we would use video conferencing from the dawn of video conferencing. So we always embraced uh, technology. So we've been utilizing Zoom for uh, you know, a number of years what we did is we worked out a Zoom license for our chapters so that they could facilitate their um, chapter meetings through Zoom. And that was um, uh, very well received by our chapters because there was really no other way for them to conduct their meetings um, in a professional way. And I would tell you that quite a few of our chapters have maintained their Zoom license. And now, even though some are back to some in-person delivery, some of their meetings, just like just like everything else in life, um, is a hybrid. Some of some of their meetings are still conducted uh, virtually. And the, or, did you find that as the pandemic waned, people were hungry for this kind of face to face and getting back to interacting in person? 
I think what people are hungry for and what their employers will, will support or what they have the bearing uh, to do are two different things. So what, um, so people may want to go back to in person and certainly we want to get back to in person, but what we're finding and I think that that other groups will will uh, share this as, uh, with you as well, is that what we're finding is that virtual is still a more popular option. Now, that is probably more popular because there are so many people working remotely or in a hybrid situation. Also, employers had the cost savings of uh, virtual deliveries. So now when you're looking at in-person deliveries, particularly when there is travel, hotel, and incidentals, and they're comparing those costs, certainly some employers are going to look at saying that, yes, an in-person delivery of a convention, people are going to get more out of. But when it comes to a training program, do you necessarily need to have uh, those additional costs? So we are um, we have less in-person uh, deliveries, um, because we try to gear them towards the market need. And what we've found is that we have an increased need for virtual deliveries. So uh, coming out of the pandemic, we are seeing uh, an, we've amped up more virtual deliveries, but we we still do have the in-person component and we'll continue to adjust those by by market need. Um, but I would tell you that in introducing one new class that we have that's foundation apparel analytics that was introduced in 22, while there is a need for people to attend it in person and there's a value to that, we have three times as many people that would like to attend it virtually. Now, um, since you kind of had the head start of embracing um, virtual, you know, pre-pandemic that obviously you had a running start when the pandemic happened and you were that much more adept at and skilled at executing that, or is there any tips you can share on how to create engagement virtually? Is it just, is education and training kind of the easiest path to create the education or were you able to do it also in these kind of just maybe informal you know, monthly meetings or things like that. I think there's many different ways to communicate, but in, in in education, I think that sometimes, sometimes in a learning experience, uh, um, when when it's being delivered, uh, which we uh, have of course acknowledged and embraced many years ago, well, you know, I would say well over 15 years ago, is that education. Well, I actually say even longer than that because of our learning centers, that education has to be more participatory, that people get more out of the educational experiences if it's not just a one-way delivery. You can have plenty of one-way deliveries when it comes to an instructor providing um, or a speaker providing information that that is, you know, webinars or uh, um, a, a more rigorous delivery. But when you're looking at six hours or 12 hours or 18 hours of education, if it doesn't have some level of uh, participation and it's not more participatory and you don't have ways for them not only to, to interact with the instructor, but also interact with each other, that um, it is difficult to keep that engagement of people. Now, by today's standards, of course, everybody's experiencing this. You will have people that want the online education and however it's being delivered, but they have a difficult time fully engaging. They won't necessarily turn on their camera. Uh, they still want to chat their questions rather than to ask their questions. But what we find, because we have been nurturing this more participatory uh, way of educating for decades is that we do have a, uh, you know, it's, it's how you've seasoned your audience. So, um, more than half of the people that attend our virtual experiences when it is six hours, you know, 12 hours, 18 hours, that, um, a good portion of the class, more than half, they are on camera and they are raising their hand and they are asking questions in the virtual environment, which does make it a much more inviting experience for them or more well-rounded experience. But you still are going to have those people that I believe have gotten into a rut by what their companies have allowed or in any other type of educational experience that they've had because of um, um, the other type of education that they may be required to achieve through their employer that have turned it into a one-way communication and don't necessarily see that um, it is to their benefit 
for it to be more participatory and for them to fully engage. Now, uh, when it comes to payroll in a macro sense, are there any uh, trends or anything in the industry that we should be on the lookout for coming forward? Um, that, uh, so I'd say that from that framework, uh, that employers, um, and this is really worldwide, um, but particularly in first world countries, that during the pandemic, we had this aspect of allowing people to work remotely. And in some aspects, we didn't always know where they were working from. Um, in places like the UK, uh, what was a predominant factor was people going to Spain to work. And in the US, um, we were very lenient as well. But in the US, of course, um, we have we have federal laws, but we also have, you know, uh, various uh, state laws and local jurisdictions. And um, during the pandemic, there was a certain leniency. But um, you will have, let's say, some well-known companies, and I'm not going to say who they are, but that will have uh, been on the news and saying, we don't care where our employees work. But it's like, do, do you really not care where they work? Because wherever they're working from, that you as the employer are going to have, have a responsibility. And um, you probably have seen it in the news, it was reported well over six months ago, that we know that there are uh, over 1.6 million Americans working in Mexico, predominantly in Mexico City. And um, there, you know, that's a big issue because it's not only do employers need to be aware of the fact of where their employees are working, but also at some juncture, those jurisdictions, you know, Mexico is going to say, we're going to need a piece of that taxation pie. And that's going to happen. That's going to be a, a, a global issue. Um, and an issue for employers in the U.S. because uh, they're going to need to take hold of and take responsibility for where their employees are working. Um, and that's something that's been a bit laxed uh, throughout the pandemic, but is going to be um, a significant issue moving forward. So there are employers that do embrace allowing people to work from wherever, but they're also doing all of the back end things that are necessary in order to make that possible. So they have to kind of ramp up some infrastructure for themselves to handle that complexity of their employees being in different states, different um, countries because of the taxation rules wherever they, that employee individually is located. They do because when when these companies are are inevitably audited, their um, their employee cell phone records. Um, these employees will have probably signed leases. Let's say there's going to be an audit. Um, even the technology for the employer, they're going to know where their people have logged in from, and all of this is going to factor into audits. Um, so employers are going to need to get in front of that and either have. Um, stricter rules about what states, let's say in the U.S., you can work in um, or or can't. And uh, if you can work outside the U.S., um, they're going to need to be aware of that and then provide for that because um, it's not as simple as saying that somebody can work in Mexico. There are certain um, corporate structures that have to change and filings that have to change. Um, so I believe there are employers that, that uh, have already you know, they, 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 they rose to the occasion and will continue to rise to the occasion. But I think the majority of employers, when they understand the complexities of um, that type of global reporting and even domestic reporting in order to uh, provide for that, will retract from allowing their employees to have um, the, you know, leniency of working anywhere they want. So I do think that that um, the pandemic certainly changed the way we work in the fact that there is this, well, there is more remote work. There is an expectation that you can be a hybrid worker or a remote worker. Um, and it is how we attract talent now is that we have to think about the fact that talent isn't necessarily going to be in our back door. We need to 
to set our sights, you know, a bit further in where we, we, uh, look and attract talent, but we have to take these other, uh, considerations, um, into the equation. We just happen to represent the payroll industry, which is highly, you know, has, has, uh, a, a slew of regulatory and legislative issues that companies have to adhere to. So it is, um, it's, you know, the space that we're in. So uh, we're more cognizant of it. But I do think that that's going to be an issue uh, for any small to medium to large size employer that is going to have to reel in what they allowed for during the pandemic. Right. So the pandemic kind of forced their hand. It seemed like they were being generous and accommodating. But, you know, once you flip that domino, there's other ramifications that are occurring that maybe you didn't realize at the time or didn't understand kind of how how many things that that affected down the road. Yes. So now, is there anything uh, through your organization that you're most looking forward to in 2023 and beyond? Any projects or uh, things you're working on? we're looking forward to that. We, I, I mentioned to you earlier that in 22, we came out with our first, um, it was called Foundations of Payroll Analytics. It's 18 hours and we provide in-person delivery and also virtual delivery. And what was great about providing that is that the attendees, um, could naturally see by the, the, um, 18 hours of education that there had to be a part two which we already had in development, but it's great when the attendees can say, I need more. So we have part two in development and we plan on having it in the marketplace before the the end of 23. So that's exciting. Um, And I believe that even past part two, it's going to continue. So it's substantial content. I believe that um, by the time we finish the series, we'll have over 50 hours of content just on this one subject matter, which to me is really exciting to procure or create new content. Um, Another exciting um, project that we're working on is that we will soon launch our online community. And we like to think of the fact that, yes, we have members, but we also have subscribers, we have customers. I think any association has to begin to look at um, what are your total engagements? Because people that may hold your certifications aren't necessarily your members, but they do think of themselves as part of your community. So when we look at our total engagements, we uh, in 22 had over 191,000 engagements. So if somebody has your certification and they're in another country, they still think of being in, uh, inside your circle. They still think of being part of your community. So when we launched this community, um, it is available to anybody worldwide. And it does, um, uh, it is for our members, for our customers, for our engagements, for those that have our certifications worldwide. So I think that it's very exciting because um, not only does it, does it connect people from around the world, because you could have, you know, somebody in uh, uh, Ohio that has an issue with, you know, German payrolls and can connect with somebody and ask a question. So it really does uh, meet the need of the fact that, you know, many years ago, people would think of a multinational company as being a really large company, but now it can really be a company of any size and they can be located anywhere. So uh, it does create a knowledge share um, within the industry because within this industry, yes, uh, every um, payroll practice or, or regulatory and legislative issue around the world is different, but payroll um, you know, as it is, 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 is pretty much processed the same way, no matter where you are. It's just pay, pay cycles are different and the laws are different, but there's a lot of commonality. And we're looking forward to launching this community because, um, uh, that yes, there are people within our community in the U S that are, just think U S centric, but their world is changing and they may not be in a multinational company today, but you don't know where their company is going tomorrow or what employer they might be working for next year. And by having this worldwide community, um, not only will it um, meet the needs that people have today, but um, people today don't realize that it, it will meet needs that they'll have in future years. Right. And it could open up other opportunities. You know, when you have this knowledge, it may not be something that you're fearful of. You embrace and you lean into and say, hey, oh, there is somebody there I can 
chat with and just ask them some questions. Absolutely. I mean, building relationships uh, worldwide, I mean, there's no negative to that. There is, there isn't. And I, I, um, that has organically happened over the years. Um, you, you know, you provide the forum for it, but then it organically happens among people. But I believe that with an online community that, that, um, uh, it will happen much faster. And then, uh, years from now, you know, in a few short years from now, there are people that would not have seen the value that will see it as being a, a very valuable tool. So what do you need more of? How can we help you? <laughs> do you need more members? Um, you need more uh, subject oh, we, matter experts? You need more chapter leads? What, how can we help? We we are always, uh, we have, have been great over the years of cultivating SMEs or subject matter experts. Um, I would tell you that, uh, uh, and I would recommend to any as, uh, organization to do this, we certainly put subject matter experts through the, the test and cultivating their natural, well, we, we improve their, their, um, their knowledge base, but we have always had professional speech coaching for decades. Um, so that, um, our subject matter experts become the best speakers they can be because they're really the voice piece for the, uh, um, for all of the hundreds of courses that we teach a year. So we always want more customers. We always want more members. We always want more people to go through our certification programs. So uh, in the in the um, various ways that we serve the payroll community, whether it's through the American Payroll Association, the Global Payroll Management Institute, uh, we always want more people to come into the fold. Well, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom and congratulations on all the success to be able to handle the pandemic as well as you did and to really use it as a launching point for even more robust services and uh, education for your members. Um, Congratulations. That is just an amazing achievement. And I hope you're proud and I hope your members appreciate what it took to do that because that's a big deal and, and you did a great job. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, You're doing important work, and we appreciate you. Thank you so much, Lee. All right, this is Lee Cantor. We'll see you all next time on Association Leadership Radio.